Welcome back. I'm Gary Parr. And I'm Beth Ellicott. And you're listening to Fiber Talk, the twice-weekly podcast for needlework artists. And our artist this week, from Carolina House Designs, Carolyn Standing Webb. Carolyn, welcome. Thank you. Okay, the first thing, I love this, that you did your first cross-stitch sampler at age 11 and you hated it. <laughs> What's this? <laughs> That's that's true. Actually, it was a stamped cross stitch. And, you know, when you do a stamped cross stitch, the crosses are never even. They're just kind of irregular. And I didn't like cross stitch until I discovered that you could actually count the threads uh. and all your crosses would turn out beautiful. <laughs> yeah, and then and then the fact that you went and found a flower sack. And did well, stitch on it. <laughs> um, I, I, what I did is I, I found a stamped kit that I really liked, and um, I, I didn't want to do it on the on the stamped fabric, and so I was trying to find something that was an even weave, and I didn't even know that Aida fabric existed at this point, so I found. You know, young, and I found a flower sack and discovered that if I counted up five threads one way and five threads over, I got a square cross stitch. And so I took the, did it the hard way. I counted from the pattern onto my fabric and I stitched them. And became a regular that, customer at the grain store, right? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's amazing the amount of patience that would take to transfer it, you know, and, and to do it on, on the flower sack. Um, that's a fabulous story. I just love it. Well, Using I, what you have. Well, and it's kind of like I didn't know any better. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yep. Make it, make it work. Well, and a young mind, yeah, a young mind will find a way. Yep. Yeah. You had, uh, so many designers and you, you, you fit right into this. You just grew up in a world of art of all kinds. That's uh, that had to be, had to have been stimulating. Well, it was because my parents actually met in, um, in college in commercial art. They were with, and uh, so it was always part of my life. My mm -hmm. dad always oil painted, but he did, tons of other things mother did pastels and sewed and so i never knew that it wasn't a possibility yeah it was, look at this color how does this go together can we try something new and it's just it was always part of my life so even and i i've embroidered since i was probably about 10 which is actually about the age i got my first sewing machine too and I've always figured, well, if I want to do it, why not go ahead? Was it always your parents uh, offering opportunity? Uh, or did you just, because it was there, just pick it up out of sheer curiosity? I think a lot of it was sheer curiosity because I often did things that they didn't do. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> things I was interested in and like they bought me the sewing machine because I wanted to do that and uh, so I just but they always they never said you can't do that it was always if you want to try it go ahead mm. here's the materials do it or don't do it okay yeah yeah and I love that you had at that young age to have a, a treadle sewing machine I'm no expert but that's one where you have to move your feet to drive the machine, right? It is, but it makes it nice because it, you can go as slow as you want. So there's none of this zipping through the machine and sewing over your finger type thing, <laughs> <laughs> which I actually have done, but you know, that's another story. <laughs> yes. Treadle show, sewing machines, safety built in. Yes. Yes. And I actually still have the machine. And, it works? and my girls learned to sew on it. It does. It works, and my girls used it. Well, that's great. A singer? Um, I don't think so, but it's been so long since I've had it out, I don't remember. Yeah. I know that in that age, there were a lot of uh, different sewing machines, some of which, of course, we've never heard of. 
Yeah, that uh, that was a that was the thing those days. Just about everybody had one in their house. That, so. Uh, well, yeah. if you've ever sewn anything by hand, one time I was taking a class and I actually stitched a man's shirt by hand, and there were a couple of advantages, but mostly it was just really tedious and it took me probably about two weeks of work where with sewing machine you can just you know a day you could make a shirt mm -hmm. and so just the sheer amount of work that it freed women from it's something that they thought was fabulous yeah right and it's, and because remember sheets are not big enough or cloth wasn't big enough to cover a bed so when you made a sheet you had to do that huge long seam if you didn't have a sewing machine you did it you by know. hand. Yes. Yeah. I, I have actually seen sheets that were stitched by hand down the center. And oh. it's the stitches are just tiny and amazing and flat. So there's no ridge at all. I kind of boggles the mind how fine their skills were at that point. Yes. Okay. So I'm learning something here. So you couldn't buy cloth wide enough for a, a bed sheet. You had to get strips and sew it together. Correct. Huh. Yeah. Um, norm, a lot of cloth was anywhere from 18 to 36 inches wide. If you got broad cloth, it was like 45 inches wide. Uh-huh. <laughs> so, so the seam kind of gave a nice dividing line. This is my side and that's your side. Okay. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> and when you turned your sheets... You unpick that seam and you turn the outside in because the wear patterns were in the center. Ah. Oh, I didn't even think of that. Okay. But, but that makes sense because, I mean, because it wasn't, I mean, cloth then was expensive. So you used right. all, you just kept it and you used all of it and used it as long as you could. But to flip it in, because I know they did that with clothing. I know they would unpick their clothing and turn it kind of inside out, you know, because the wear pattern was different. Um, yeah, you'd take a skirt and turn the, the bottom into the top. And, uh, yeah, fabric was terribly expensive, and labor was really cheap. So it's rare to have an existing garment that hasn't been remade at least once. Hmm. And then when, when that's done, then you make it into a quilt. You can make it into quilt. You'd cut it down for somebody else. You'd sell it for rags. Yes. Um, wow. I missed that part. <laughs> <laughs> oh, darn. Oh, darn. <laughs> aren't, aren't we glad we don't live then and, and have to do that with our, our, our fabric? Yeah. We have such a nice stash anymore. Right. Yeah. It gets a little worn. You pitch it. Yeah. We're... Well, it, it kind of tells you, okay, the fabric and the you know materials were so expensive, and that these young girls were actually taking these fa these fabrics and this silk thread, and creating something. It kind of shows the value of what they were doing, mm -hmm. you know, just because of the sheer monetary value of it. Yeah, but now could could we say that the fabric quality was much better then? Thicker, heavier? Not necessarily. No. Okay. Um. There were some fabrics that we struggle to produce today um, because they were so fine and beautiful and sheer. Um, mm -hmm. But then there was also a lot of fabric that wasn't very good. In fact, the word sleazy we get because fabric was not very good quality. It wasn't woven very tightly. Um, it wasn't spun very well, but there were there were absolutely exquisite, beautiful things. But it's like now, some some things are good and some things are bad, and so they had the whole range at that point. Plus, if your fab if your clothing had to last, you tended to pick fabric that was sturdier. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, I just asked that because just in buy, buying dress shirts uh, when I used to have to dress up. Um, <laughs> Yeah, it, it was always. It's harder today, I think, than twenty, thirty years ago, to get dress shirts that have uh, that are made out of cloth that has real substance to it. It seems like it's just always thin and flimsy, and uh, so when I find a brand or a shirt that is made out of 
good Oxford cloth, then I'll buy several just because uh, I know they'll last for a long time. So uh, it just seems to me like, at least for, for shirts for me, uh, that you can't get good quality shirts anymore. Well, I mean, I'm sure you can if you spend a fortune, but uh, um, interesting. Okay. Well, you think at that time they actually were spending a fortune on their fabrics. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, we have so many things now that the quality, it's hard to get good quality in a lot of things. Yeah. So how where does needlework come out of this? What What makes you go down that path instead of, well, because your dad did oil painting, your mother sewed, you sewed, uh, your dad did carving and jewelry. Where, where, where does needlework emerge for you? Well, I'd always done it. I come from the era where you had the hope chest, and so you had the um, pillowcases and dish towels and things that you embroidered on. And it was something that I enjoyed doing, and so I... Uh, I just kind of kept it up, you know, as a teenager, not very much, uh, but I did a little. And then after I um, married and had a couple of kids, I st kind of got back into it and uh, did it on my own for a number of years. And, uh, and then I joined the Embroiderers Guild of America and the whole world of needlework just kind of <laughs> exploded. <laughs> yeah, it's an amazing group when you don't know anything but cross stitch and I think I knew cross stitched a little bit of cruel work, you know, the stamped things from dimensions and then the stamped and stamped cross stitch. I think that was what I knew. And then I joined EGA and it's like, oh, look at all this fun stuff. Oh, I know. <laughs> well, yeah, I'd always done the surface embroidery because that's what we did on the, you know, but simple outline mm -hmm. stitches and lazy daisy and a few things like that and suddenly there's black work and gold work and you know yeah. all kinds of fabulous things right yeah that's what one of the the pluses at, at ega you go to their websites like a big candy store yeah mm -hmm. yeah so you so you you saw the light and then things just took off was it was it try everything or did you focus a, a as, as the kids were growing up, they were focused on a technique or two. Um, that's kind of hard. Well, I did. I did, was doing mostly surface because that's what I was used to. And remember, this is I don't have the love affair with counted work because of the horrible cross stitch. <laughs> um, and so I suddenly discovered, oh, there's. The first class that I took was a, a black work class, and uh, the teacher said, get a even weave. And so I'm hunting for an even weave, and not knowing what I'm doing, I finally actually got the correct thing. And, they didn't, they uh, didn't have that at the grain store? No, no, no <laughs> not at the grain store. Um, and uh, anyway, I get that and I start with the black work and I'm going, oh, hey, this is fun. We actually have, you know, we don't have to count all over the all, over all those threads per inch. And so it just kind of blossomed. And I still love to take classes because even if it's a technique that I know and that I do, you always learn something. Every teacher always has a little bit different approach and sometimes it's just this little nugget they throw out in the middle of class and um, you know as a teacher I've been you know I've taught people who who know the technique and I'll say something and then they'll go hey whoa that was the worth the price of admission just mm. that one little technique that that you pick up that then kind of cross pollinates because it goes into all of the other uh, types of embroidery that, that you do and so it's not like you learn one technique and it only all you, you know, the things you learn stay in that no they kind of spread to all of the other things that you do right well i think that's the great thing about this hobby is just that you can uh, learn something from any number of techniques and take it with you uh, across the borders if you will and uh, it, it all applies and i think you get better all the way along just for uh, trying things Right. Yeah. 
The right. I was just going to ask about you know classes. So, um, you've you have you taken some Zoom classes? Do you offer Zoom classes? I don't offer Zoom classes. Um, I have taken Zoom classes. I did uh, Natalie Dupuis class on uh, couching, which was fabulous, but. To do a class like hers, there's so much set up. Um, right. I've right. done some demonstration demonstrations on Zoom classes, but never set up anything that complicated. Um, you kind of have to decide, okay, what am I going to? Where are am Where am I in my life? Um, and how much do I want to get into this? And how much energy do I want to expend in? The electronic part rather than the designing and the teaching part so it's always a balancing act right right you i find you unique in that you do your own design work but then you you have a constant flow or at least appears a constant flow of uh, stitching designs and doing work that others have put together it's like a dual thing for you because a lot of designers will well i just design and i have time to stitch the stuff i design uh, and then they eventually just get away from doing other people's work. Uh, you you keep that dual track going. Yeah, for the most part, I do. I my taste in embroidery is kind of eclectic. I like this and I like that and I like the other. And so I, uh, it's like you take the class and you go, oh, well, this would be fun to try my own design in this technique mm. so um or i'll see something that just fascinates me i just did um a little tiny elizabethan blackwork jacket that i found in a magazine and uh, it interested me one because it's blackwork which i like um two because it's i like that elizabethan or well that jacobean jacket form like the laden jacket and um i'd kind of always wanted to do one and so it all came together and so i stitched the jacket and of course it had clothing construction techniques and then i designed and stitched a skirt to go with it and uh, so it's kind of like one feeds the other um most artists when they throughout their life they will copy the work of others so it's something that's a maybe because of the artistic way that I came into this, it's just part of what you do. You do your things and you create your things, but yet you look at the work of others. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, you get influenced by that and then you do your own take on it. And Right. Yeah, different, different exposures and, and, yeah. And I've noticed you've been... Um, like you design like boxes and um, you've taken, where is that? Where does that come from? That, that desire to construct? Um, Probably from my sewing background, you know, cause you're taking fabric and you're constructing and uh, you know, there are only so many things you can hang on the wall. Right. Um, <laughs> right. <laughs> right. And so, um, and I like the little small things. I'm kind of a collector at heart. And so, um, you know, if I, if I get something, okay, I've got a box. Okay, what can I put in the box? Well, I can put a scissors bob. I can put a scissor sheath. I can put a pin cushion. I can put all these other things that actually go in the box. And uh, it's a lot of fun. And it, you know, kind of gives me that. It's not just one static square design that hangs on the wall we have all these other fun things that we can look at and do and discover and add to the collection the, right, you know, right. you've got a scissors swab you need a scissors to go with it right or right. you might need another um thread winder to go in the little box that just matches perfectly um, yes and since i've collected antique sewing tools for years um you know, you'll go, okay, I have this cool pair of scissors. Well, this needs a place to put it, and, well, we can put it in this box, and it matches this, and it, um, you know, designers get ideas from the oddest places. You'll be looking at something and go, 
oh, that is really an interesting shape to this. What can I do with it? Or sometimes you'll look at it and, and think, oh, that's interesting. Kind of file it in the back of your mind. Mm-hmm. And then a few le- years later, something just tumbles out. And you've taken this little kernel of a design and turned it into something entirely different. Sometimes you don't even recognize where it started, but it ends up kind of growing and blossoming. And then can I add something? I've been known over the years to to do something and, and you know, even a box or something and think, well, they haven't added enough things. Well, let me see what I can add to it. Can I take bits of their design, turn it into something else and add to it. And I think that's fun. Okay, you, you, you hated, I shouldn't say hated, you disliked Counted Thread, but then you get a Master Craftsman certification in Counted Thread. What, yeah. what, what made you turn the corner? <laughs> <laughs> well, remember, remember I, had, I had discovered black work and then... Um, that there's actually thread that you can or fabric that you can count you can see the threads (laughs) and so i um, signed up for the master craftsman program through the embroiderers guild and um, they take you in steps through different things so you've got you do a sampler first and then you do black work and you do pulled thread and hard onger and what am i missing oh missing one other but anyway and so um i had done i had done the sampler and and designed it which you know it's kind of a big step that first time so anyway i designed the stitch the sampler and then i had done my black work piece and uh for years i have worked usually one day a week at a a a needlework store And so some of the women who came in saw what I had designed and said, oh, you've got to teach this. And uh, so that's kind of what got me into teaching. But the more I learned, the more I liked it. I Mm -hmm. like, and I find that counted thread is usually an easy thing to teach because you say, okay, this is how the stitch, these are the steps for the stitch, and these are the holes you put them in. Mm Mm-hmm. And most people feel like they can accomplish something, you know, and it looks good. I mean, a cross stitch is a cross stitch, and there are certain things you can do to make it better, but generally it's a very approachable technique, and most counted thread is this way. And so you just combine the different counted threads and then share it with people. I, my... um, college degree is in education and I find I can't resist sharing with people and um, there's something about that you're teaching someone something and that that light goes on them in their eyes and it's just it's a cool feeling that they have finally understood this and then you know you get to share and well maybe this will you know maybe this will work better for you um when I start my classes, I always say, okay, I will, I will teach you the, usually the technique. I'll do a couple of different things, but if I don't happen to find the approach that works for you, let me know. Because some people are very ver- visual and some people are very verbal. And most of us are a combination of the two. Um, if you, I'm very visual, and so if you start describing something to me, it just goes in one side and falls out the other. But if you show me a picture or you demonstrate it, then I understand. And so all of us have to do that, kind of get that combination. And so it's fun to find the combination where somebody goes, oh, I understand. Yeah, no, it, it would be fun to get needle workers together and uh, cause now I, I learn by reading. Um, I, that's, that's just always the way I've learned. And as a, I'm a former teacher. So, you know, I, I've experienced the same things you have and uh, um, it would be interesting to get needle workers of different learning types in a room and see how they approach it and uh, approach a single project and see what comes out of it. I bet, it, I bet you'd learn some things 
uh, in terms of teaching classes, just out of watching them work uh, in different ways and sharing ideas. So. Well, you do because, and that's one reason that I still take classes because you'll have a teacher and they'll do something. And you'll think, oh, that's cool. I'm going to incorporate that in what I do mm -hmm. because it's helped people. And that's, as a teacher, that's what you want to do. You're doing it to spread those things that you love to other people. Right, right. So the certification program, uh, difficult or just a, a long process that you just had to hang in there? What What's that like to go through? Because I, I have to say I've been interested more than once in doing one of those uh, programs to get some kind of a certification and just chicken out. Uh, is it, <laughs> are they, uh, is it, uh, is, is it, I, I, I know it's a lot of work. You can tell that just by reading the, the direct, the synopsis of, of what you have to do, but, uh, difficult or just plug away at it and you get there. It's probably a little of both. Part of it is just the understanding, you know, the directions and then, um, going ahead and taking the time to do it and then um, mastering the technique because the master craftsman is demonstrating expertise in that specific technique. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you think you are doing better than you really are. Now, when I did <laughs> mine, okay, there, okay. There, are, there are six steps to it. Okay, you can get a pass, which means hey, you got it, you're spot on. A provisional pass means this is pretty good, but there are a couple of things you have to fix. And then there are fails, which means, okay, you go back to square one and start over. And of my six steps, two of them I passed the first time, two of them I passed provisionally, and two of them I failed. Mm. And so you have to be able to think, okay, why did I fail and what did I do wrong? Um, of my two failures, one of them I wasn't surprised because I knew I was pushing the edges of the design part. Um, the technique I was fine, but the design part I knew I was pushing the edges of what was acceptable. And they said, nah, start over. So I did. <laughs> um, and the other one I still disagree but, <laughs> eh, you know, um, that's okay. That's part of the, that's part of the learning. If we did everything perfect the first time, then we wouldn't still take classes. Right. And so, and so after I had, after I had finished it, then I became chairman of the program for five years, which means that twice a year people would send, um, their pieces in and I had a committee and we would get together and we would look at their work and try and give them, you know, as much constructive criticism as we could. Right. Um, you've done this well, you haven't done this, you didn't follow the directions, you, all of that to kind of work them through and we want everybody to succeed. So mm -hmm. you try and, and do what you can to, to spur them on. Um, so that they can finish it. So what is that? You're, you're the rookie. Nobody wants to run this program. You have to. What was that deal? Um, <laughs> ouch. Ouch. Um, no, I don't know. It was just one of those things I had been teaching, so they knew who I was. Yeah. And uh, going ahead and just finishing the program. And when I finished it, they said, can you? And I said, okay, um, I'll, I'll try not? it. And I got a great group with me, a certified judge and some other people that had a lot of depth. And so we kind of worked together as a, as a group. I was more, you know, overseeing it rather than doing all of it. Yeah, yeah. So what, what do you take, all right, obviously when you complete something like that, you develop a, a high level of skill. There's no, you know, I, I have no question about that. But long term, what do you take out of that? Do you take, is it the foundation it puts under you as you reach out to do your own things? 
what uh, there has to be some long term payoff that somewhere down the road you go, wow, if I hadn't taken that course, I wouldn't have this. Hmm. Um, I th think part of it's that I think that you it does. It gives you a great foundation to think I have mastered these techniques and now they're kind of second nature. I've done them enough so that I can do them and I can um, enjoy the process rather than stressing over the technique. Mm -hmm. Enjoy stitching it, um, using it to do something else. Um, and so as I design, I know that I know the techniques and so that I can work on, okay, how can I um, incorporate these techniques into what I'm teaching other people? So mine is, is kind of more the sharing part, but I know other people have done it. And part of it is just the satisfaction. I did this. It was not easy, but I'm proud of what I've done. And uh, it, it, it gives me courage to attempt different things and new things that I may not have done if I hadn't gone through this, this program and, and finished it. Mm -hmm. And even if you don't finish it, you still learn things. Yeah. But so, so it takes, it, when it comes to design work, it takes that, the technique aspect out of it in terms of, part of what you have to work at as you're doing a design that, that just is a second nature goes to the background and you can really focus on your design work and uh yeah i can see how that would help move things forward because it's it's no longer all right i have to remember how to put the stitch together you already know that so you can just focus on the design and what the stitch will do for it right right yeah. okay because that yeah yeah, I mean, all that work to to achieve something like that. Yeah, I, I agree with you. It, a lot of pride in accomplishing that. But uh, it's also a lot of knowledge that you take in and that has to pay off down the road in, in maybe ways you don't even realize or, or that are kind of surprising. Yeah, very much so. It Yeah, because it you've you've gone through a program that takes – the fastest you can go through is two and a half years. And, uh, you know, a lot of people take longer than that. You know, life gets in the way. You right. think, oh, I've got this block of time. I can do this. And, oh, my, you know, my life blows apart and I'm not getting it done. Or, yeah, I thought I knew what I was doing. Eh, let me pause this while I go take a class and figure <laughs> out more of what I'm <laughs> supposed to be doing. Yeah. Right. Well, that, I and, that's, I, go ahead. I, I just think that, you know, that's that's the thing that makes me curious about the Master Craftsman program is that I think, you know, you, you know, you think, you know, a technique. But I know myself well enough. And I'm like, hmm, where are all the I have too many holes, you know, <laughs> but maybe just uh, taking it would expose those holes and, and point me in the right direction of taking a, a, a more specific class so that I'm ready to do a master craftsman class that's true plus i think it also because most of the classes have usually five separate techniques and then you have to put them together for the final the the master one um there may be one that you're a little weaker on or that you think you don't like so you have to get into it enough to think, oh, this is not as bad as I thought. Or, you know, I'm never going to do this one again. <laughs> right. <laughs> and I have a couple of those. I think everyone does. I have a couple right. of techniques that I think, oh, this was not very fun. And uh, although I know how to do it, it's not going to be something that I'm going to do because I enjoy it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We all end up with those. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have a couple. No, thank you. Pass. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You seem to, as as your work has evolved, it seems that that rising to the top, if you will, uh, certainly black work, um, stump work. Is that kind of where your head goes these days? Um, 
I've always been fascinated by the um, stump work, needlework boxes or caskets. When I, um, I'm a, I read a lot. And um, when I first saw one in a book, I thought, I want that. <laughs> I want <laughs> no, I one guess. of those casket <laughs> thingies. And, yeah, talk um, to Beth. Talk to Beth about her casket. <laughs> let's, let's have a yeah. conversation about Beth's casket. <laughs> Yes. My, my, mine, mine is not. Mine's still in its box. It's, I, I'm not ready to start that casket yet. Okay. Well, mine has progressed a little. When we hit the epidemic and we shut down the world, I uh, set up a couple of tables and I got my box out and I actually glued all of the paper onto the outside of the box because that's one of the steps. And talk about a learning curve. This is like skiing down a double black diamond ski slope. <laughs> this is throw yourself into the deep end and swim for it. Anyway, so I I glued all the paper on the outside and then I I did the fabrics and things on the inside. So right now my box sits in all its white pristine glory without any embroidery on it. Okay, so have you done some of the I have you done all the embroidery that goes on the outside of the box? No, I have done um, part of it. Um, the box has so many sections to it, but there's one little band to crown the, the top, and that I have done. And I have um, another section of it designed and partially stitched. Um, but then I kind of got off on a tangent of thinking, well, you know, I want some more techniques to go on this, and um, so let me learn a little bit more. And um, so that's at the point where I am now. I, I'm, I'm kind of crystallizing what I want to do because I don't have my design set. You don't have to do your own design, but I can't resist doing my own. So well, I was um, wondering that. I was wondering if you were going to design your own box or if you were just going to do what. Trisha Nguyen set out. Yeah, I'm going to design my own. I can't. I can't help myself. I just <laughs> have to do this. So I'm going to lose, use a lot of the techniques and the threads and the fun things, you know, that she's done in the class. But it's going to be my own design with. Um, it's going to have a lot of the flavor, but there's a really unique look to the reproduction boxes and mine won't quite have that but it's going to have oh like dimensional elephants and flowers and all kinds of fun things on it and I'm still in the uh, I don't quite have the design in my head where I want it to be I guess that's where I am right now and so I've been taking classes and I've been learning all kinds of new things and um, one day it'll just tumble out and I'll finish it but so it's that, something to look forward to so that's a, a, a an approach for you then uh, as you work on this being the main project uh, go take some classes to develop techniques and skills uh, that then allow you to approach this casket uh, from a better perspective partially I I don't think the casket is kind of the focus of what I'm doing mm -hmm. um but I think that um, the the gold work and the dimensional work is kind of the the apex of the embroidery um, because it is just so spectacular. And so um, I've been, even though I still do, I still, you know, do surface work, which is kind of where I started. I still do all of it, but I'm, you know, it's kind of like, oh, sparkly. I, you know, I want to play with these things. <laughs> I yeah. so understand that. I so yes. understand that. Uh-huh. And so it's kind of like it's here, it's on the side, and I'm, I'm working toward it. But it's not kind of my focus. Okay. Um, but, and you, and I've noticed, I was reading your blog, you make little, you've been making things to add into your box, too. Yes, I have. Which is um, 
Well, I did. What I did is I kind of approached it as, um, okay, if I were a girl from that era, what steps would I have taken? So I've kind of done the polychrome sampler. Um, I did a white work sampler. I've done kind of some of the things that steps that they went through to kind of make up the story and, and so I could put them in my casket. So I have a number of the small things. And then, of course, being the needlework collector, I couldn't resist, you know, what would have gone in it? Well, a stray button because it fell off. So I had to find a, a uh, 17th century button. I have a thimble from that area. I have a couple of pins, kind of the fun things that are going to go in the box that kind of complete the story. Hmm. Oh, how fun. That makes it much more interesting as a, as a whole, as just rather than just, yes, I've embroidered this box and it's cool, which is cool in and of itself, but all the things you're going to add that add to the story. I love right. that. There we go. See, Beth, yours is going to be a great box one day when you haul it out of the cardboard box that shipped in. It's going to be exciting. <laughs> well, and I and I did see how Carolyn she has her threads organized for that, and I'm thinking, oh, I, that looks really nice. I might have to invest in one of those tiered trays for all my threads for this casket because it needs it. It needs something. Well, I've just, for my mind, and of course, everybody's mind is different, but for my mind, unless I have a certain amount of organization, I can't think. It's like there are too many things. Um, and if you have to dig down in the bottom of the box and try and find a thread, you're not going to find it. So right. I kind of organized mine in colors. So all the, um, the, all of the threads um, of that color kind of go together so if I'm filling in an area and I want a yellow well I have you know I have a dozen different threads that are yellow which ones do I want to use how can I make this a little bit different and how can I use some of those fabulous threads that Tricia has had created for us right. uh, to kind of fill in the vision of, of what I'm going to do what's you know kind of the unexpected things Okay, so this brings another question. Do you organize all your threads by color then, or do you organize them by thread type? A little of both. Um, this, the, the casket has more of the, you know, if it's yellow, it's in the box. But mm -hmm. usually I take and a thread type kind of is organized in colors within that thread type like my overa swath threads or um i bought a selection of chinese silks mm -hmm. and there were a hundred colors and five shades of each color and so those are in a in a drawer so i have all of that kind so it's usually in in kind of thread and then colors in that kind of thread but I'm not really um, I mean some people they spend their life organizing well mine is kind of semi-organized maybe is the way to put it because <laughs> I'd rather be stitching than organizing yes 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 I just I was just curious <laughs> it's interesting how projects like these caskets it, to the layperson you see a finished casket and your jaw drops and you ex explore it visually and that's really neat and so on and so forth. But to the stitcher, there are so many other facets, uh, aspects of that project as a whole that happen as you're putting it together that uh, maybe are equal to and sometimes uh, are, are more than in terms of meaning the actual casket. Uh, the, the whole uh, design process, the learning how to use threads, all those kinds of, of things where if you just did like a, a cross-stitch sampler, you'd sit down and stitch it and that'd be it. But uh, these bigger projects just carry so much more with them than just finishing the project. Yeah, they for sure they do because they, they you know, it, so for some people, 
their joy is they have the casket they got the design from Trish and they are going to stitch it and they're going to put it together and they're going to love it and that's fine but for others of us okay I've got the casket I've got the design but what am I going to do that's a little bit different and and so you you take it in a different direction if you look at the historical caskets no two of them are the same some of them have great uh, sections that are woven cards they're pretty plain it's pretty basic it's the same technique and others are just a riot of uh, technique and mm-hmm. design and they've you can tell that they've had fun with it. it hasn't been something that oh yeah I've got to finish this it's been oh well what can I do with this um, how can I take those parts of me that are creative and bring me joy and can I put it on this and I like the ones that tell stories you know right. whether it's you know, whether it's a personal story, you know, some of the modern ones, they, a lot of them have been telling stories about family or the stories, there's stories from the Bible on some of the older ones. And I just love, I love the stories. And that's what intrigues me about yours is that you're making yours even more of a story by adding certain trinkets inside the box to have, to add to that story. Right. And, uh, you know, so you, you find, you have to find what makes you happy. And so this is making me happy that I can kind of explore it. And I even um, I even created a, a doll that is supposedly the stitcher of my of my uh, cabinet, whose name is um, Catherine Boswell. And uh, this is her casket. And since she was from Scotland, is actually called a kist. Because a box in Scotland is, that's one name for it. So this is Catherine's Kissed. And so how would she have thought about it from that, you know, that point of view? What would she have seen? What did she live through? Um, And so it's my story, but it's also kind of her story, too, as I'm creating this. And um, anyway, so I dressed a doll. I I bought a porcelain doll. And... um, kind of reorganized her body because it wouldn't fit the the clothes so I went and back into my sewing days and um, I got the books that show actually how the clothing is constructed so I constructed her clothing as period appropriate as I could so she has her chemise and her her stays and her petticoats and I embroidered her clothes because it just for me, it's just part of that whole story that I want to put with the casket. Um, one of the gals who has already got her casket stitched, she stitched all these little people on her casket. So she kind of created the people and dressed them and actually told her story on her casket. Um, Right. And, but that's, that is so fun, you know, and, and, and the fact that you made a little doll for it and then did embroidery for her clothing. Um, I love it. I just love that idea. Wow. What comes out of these things? See, this is, you know, this is what's so neat is it's more than just a project you do. It's um, yeah, there's, there's depth to it. That's fun. That's fun. Yep. So, Carolyn, where is your where is your design work, your your designs for sale? Where's that headed these days? Um, it's kind of slow at the moment. Okay. Um, <laughs> well, you know, you can't, they're only twenty four hours in a day, and you do have to sleep part of it. Um, so um, they are still there, and they are kind of nagging me. You know, you get the idea, and it kind of nags you, and then you go, "Okay, fine, I'm gonna <laughs> do this," and and work on it and and get it out so um you know anyway i have i have the the designs that i do for retail and um and for a while i took kind of a break from teaching i had been traveling and teaching for over 20 years and that kind of gets old because your whole life is absorbed in what project am I going to teach next? Because when you are teaching, 
they ask for proposals and so you think them up and you stitch them and you submit them and they may sit there for a year to 18 months before you can actually stitch them so you're always working a couple of years ahead and um and you lose that what am i going to do for my creative thing that i'm not teaching because some of the things that i do that are fun for me are not really teachable. I've had people say, oh, please come and teach that. And I look at them and I think, there is no way <laughs> I can write directions for what I did. <laughs> I made it up as I went along. Yeah. And, um, you know, sourcing the materials or just writing the directions for something really um, intricate and and. Anyway, they're, they're mine, and they're going to stay mine, and I'm not going to teach them. So I kind of have things I do for me, things that I teach, and then things that um, are retail because trying to write directions for a retail market for things that you teach in person is really difficult to go from one to the other because there's so much that is shown and given verbally in a class that you can't do in a retail pattern. Mm-hmm. And so it's kind of the three things that I do. And right now the retail part has been kind of on the back burner because I've been doing the other things. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, we've been learning that uh, in talking to different designers, that, that difference between what you as a designer would do for you and what you what you can do for a retail design that will work for the you know the greater masses. Or what you can, right. what, there, there's a there's a limitation there that is interesting, in uh, in terms of I can turn the, I can sell this thing and I know people will have success, but in order to do that I have to dial it back a little bit. Well, you die, you kind of approach it from a di- different direction. Mm-hmm. You know, I've I've written design you know patterns for constructing some of the small things that I do and I've gotten pretty good at being able to tell people how to do it how to cut it out assemble it what stitches to use and make it so that it is friendly enough so that they can have success because there's nothing worse than getting into something and thinking where are the rest of the directions? <laughs> I can't do this because I can't understand what they're talking about. Yeah. Right. And so writing instructions is a totally different subset from stitching, designing, teaching. It's a, yeah. 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 It's, it's an interesting little aspect of, of uh, the design process. All right. I got to know the antique needlework tools. Something yes. you've done all along, a more recent thing, and where do you find these things? <laughs> okay. I started collecting them no. years ago, um, you know, because interested in sewing. Oh, well, there's this cool pair of scissors. Like, I was on a family vacation, and I found a pair of scissors that were um, Paul Parrot, which is like a shoe manufacturer. So it's one of those advertising things. So I would, I like to antique. Or I like to more because I've, my house is full and I can't do it that much anymore because if something comes in, something has to go out. And I like the things <laughs> I have. Well, you know, you need more than an, a path through your house. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> right. It's a good practice, um, yes. <laughs> yes. And so I, I started, you know, kind of concentrating on the smaller things. So as we would travel, I would hunt through antique stores and different things and find different antique tools, you know, sewing tools. And they're kind of few and far between. And then one day, a friend of mine introduced me to eBay. Uh oh. Which is the biggest, you know, <laughs> uh, a a collector's dream place. You know, you fall right. into the you know the rabbit hole and you never come out. So I was able to find things that I had maybe seen two of in years. Oh, suddenly there are twenty of them. Which one do you want? You know, how much <laughs> you want to spend? 
So for the first couple of years, I spent and, you know, acquired all kinds of things. And then I got to where the point, well, I have one of those, so you have to be more selective. And then I also, as I'm teaching, we do lectures. And so I had a lecture on needlework tools. And so I would think, oh, well, I don't have one of these, so I can put it in my lecture. So you would buy one of those. So Yeah, we call that rationalization, but that's okay. Of course. (laughs) And so now I'm to the point where I think, It has to be super special for me even to think about it because I have them, I love them, uh, but I'm not doing the lecture now, so I don't have the excuse of I have to buy it for the lecture. And so I'm, you know, kind of getting other things, but I still, you know, I have the, the, uh, have the things and I and I look at it and I enjoy looking at them yeah. and you think who used this how did they use it what is their story mm-hmm. um, which of course they're disconnected from everyone from everyone so you don't know the story but uh, women throughout history this has been one of their main things the the sewing or repairing of the household goods that they had so these were the tools that were absolutely necessary and so um you know kind of who used it and i'm you know i have it now i have kind of care of it now yeah. and one day i will pass it on to somebody else mm-hmm. who is just beginning to have fun and, and collect these things so is the collection uh thimbles scissors or oddball things Yes. Thank you. (laughs) Okay. Um, I have a fondness for for pear-shaped needlework tools. So I have, um, oh, like tape measures and um, thimble holders and um, a pin poppet, which is a little small container. Years ago, women were actually pinned into their clothing, and so they had to carry extra pins with them. So this was a little container you put a few pins in, put it in your pocket, so that when a pin popped out, you'd have a replacement so you didn't fall apart in public. So anyway, I have, yeah. (laughs) So I I kind of like those. So if I see, so usually now if I see something pear-shaped, I will I will go ahead and buy it, but um, I have things as odd as a pin cushion that is formed around a chicken wishbone. Whoa! They were really Whoa. popular, kind of creepy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. But but they were a real thing, and so I mean I've seen dozens of them online. Um, so. Anyway, I had all the way from that up to um, in France, there was a, a building called the Palais Royale. And so the ultimate of needlework tools were created and sold there. And so the handles are mother of pearl. And, um, and so they have scissors with the most exquisitely carved mother of pearl handles thimbles that are made out of pearl, uh, thread winders, um, timbre hooks, all kinds of things. And so, um, you know, so I have all the way from the, you really are going to collect that to these things are beautiful. And even if no one, if you don't sew, you can look at them and go, those are fabulous. Uh, so my collection kind of runs the the whole area of needlework. So there now we have a new benchmark for needlework tool, antique needlework tools. It's, your collection is <laughs> not complete unless you have a chicken wishbone pincushion. Right, right. That, yeah, otherwise you're 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 uh, you're a rookie yet. Yeah. Okay. Yes, you have not reached <laughs> bottom yet. <laughs> Yeah, out of this whole hour, that's what I'm taking out of that. Okay. (laughs) Oh man, that's different. I got now. I got to see a picture of that. That's got to be. Yeah, me too. I got to go look that up. That's that's on my on my list of things to look up. I've never heard of anything like that. Never. Mm, That's Mm. different. 
Carolyn, thank you so much. Really enjoyed it. Oh, well, thank you so much for having me on this visit. And thank you to Gary and Beth for everything. And um, good luck with your sewing. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks to everyone for listening. 